The Hyperloop is the third thing Elon Musk is famous for, following closely behind Tesla and SpaceX. But the thing is, vacuum trains are a century-old idea already, and Elon Musk's idea, the air cushion-based system, the hockey table in a vacuum tube, it's just not a viable solution. And so when Elon Musk made the idea open source, and then let all these private companies start messing with it, predictably all of them abandoned the air cushion technology. All of them now use maglev. With that, it's safe to say that Elon Musk has contributed absolutely nothing to this project. He just threw the idea out there with great fanfare, made it open source, and then let some private companies do whatever the hell they want. Who then immediately broke away from the air cushion tech because it was a bad idea. And believe it or not, this exact same thing has already happened in the second half of the 20th century. Have you heard about the French Aero train? It was this brand new, ultra-fast, air cushion-based train, because back then you were allowed to call these things trains, which promised to revolutionize transportation. Grandiose plans were made, working prototypes were built, and then fast forward a few years and no one's talking about it. And why was that? Well, because maglev technology was gaining traction, and it promised to be much more efficient than the air cushion tech. Now, this was in the 1970s. We don't see too many maglevs around, do we? Well, first off, it's expensive as shit, and profitability is questionable at best. You know the uh, Shanghai Airport Maglev, uh, perhaps the most famous project? That thing just bleeds money. Namely, around $100 million each year. Now that's a lot. And the one thing that's even more expensive is building the damn thing. In today's dollars, the Shanghai Maglev cost $56 million per kilometer. In contrast, high-speed rail costs between $17 and $21 million per kilometer. This is in China, of course, where the Maglev is. Meaning that if you build a maglev, your costs can be up to four times as much as conventional high-speed rail. And then along comes Elon Musk and says, hey, let's just put a vacuum chamber over it and it'll somehow be cheaper. For example, in India, the proposed chennai Bengaluru Hyperloop line was estimated at $20 million per kilometer, including land purchases. $8 million cheaper than the conventional high-speed rail, which is also being built there. Now, version Hyperloop 1 in 2016 came out with a more sober estimate, which is $134 to $193 million per kilometer. Now, that being said, conventional high-speed rail can be incredibly expensive as well. The California high-speed rail costs $164 million per kilometer. But here's the thing. The project's exorbitant price does not come from the fact that it's a train. You know, trains aren't these, like, future-age tech. Uh, they have been built before and they have been built for much cheaper. The causes for that exorbitant price are external. Namely, that you're trying to build a long, continuous thing through California through other people's lands and through very densely built out areas, and also through some geologically active terrain. And this is something that high-speed rail and the Hyperloop have very much in common. But of course with the Hyperloop comes the additional challenge of putting a vacuum tube over the rails. But hey, the private sector's best minds are working on this issue for almost a decade now, so what have they accomplished in that time? So there are two companies doing actual visible work on this, uh, Virgin Hyperloop and Hyperloop TT, as in Transportation Technologies. So first off, Virgin Hyperloop. They now have a live test of a pod for two people. And oh my god, who put these panels together? There isn't a straight line there. There's like gigantic gaps all over. It's asymmetrical. And of course these panels are not, you know, structural elements. They're just decoration. But just optics-wise, this is kind of terrible. You know, since building a vacuum chamber involves putting together pieces very, 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 very precisely. Anyway, it doesn't exactly scream professionalism or, you know, high-tech precision. And the other thing is, I highly suspect that this is just a private jet fuselage cut up and put into a futuristic tube. So I think that's the reason why the windows are at their shoulders for some reason, because this is indeed an airplane fuselage and their seats are somewhat raised above where the airplane seats would normally be. But aside from concerns over quality and the method of construction, is this impressive? Should we be impressed? Well, not after more than half a decade, six years. Virgin Hyperloop started in 2014 and this test took place in November 2020. And so this test would have been impressive in like early 2016. You know, if they spent 2014 uh, founding the company and then 2015 working out the prototypes and then in 2016 we see a human test. Like at that point I would have been like halfway impressed. But to do this test at the end of 2020? 
I mean, if they came out with some kind of new technology of like, hey, here's our new vacuum tunnel, you know, 10 times cheaper to build and, you know, not prone to failure. But instead they were like, hey, check out our giant Tic Tac in a small vacuum tube with two people in it this time. The journalists have called it a breakthrough, but this is really just like a half-assed proof of concept, really. And so let's look at the other company, Hyperloop TT, and see what they've been up to. What is this, a CGI image? and uh, the world's first full-scale Hyperloop isolation valve. Wow! It only took them eight years. So why is progress on the Hyperloop so painfully slow, so glacial? Well, that's because the Hyperloop is just not a good concept. Because there's a huge contradiction right in the middle of it. Namely, that the Hyperloop would only make sense on long distances, but the one thing that would be incredibly difficult to build is long vacuum tubes. Whereas with conventional rail, or maglev even, distance is not really an issue. Only in terms of costs, maybe. So it doesn't really matter how far two cities are from each other. Building a train generally makes sense, because trains are very highly adaptable to varying distances. You know, there's a reason why Austrian railjets have a maximum speed of 230 km per hour. Whereas the French TGV goes by 320 km per hour. Different distances, different speeds. But even if you have two points between which the Hyperloop's speed is viable, you will still need to sell the idea to the people who will be ultimately paying for it, namely the taxpayers. And so if you're a decision maker and propose a hyperloop connecting two cities, you will have a rather difficult time selling it to people. You know, everyone likes shiny CGI and everyone seems to be uncritically accepting everything Elon Musk says. However, when it comes to their money, people tend to be much more defensive and conservative. And so during public discussions of the Hyperloop, inconvenient questions might surface. Such as, instead of building this nice shiny high-end system which is not compatible with everything else we have, why not just improve existing infrastructure? You know, Aunt Julie has trouble climbing up the tram every day because it's a banged up high floor thing from the 1950s and then it chugs along into the city center at 20 km per hour because the tracks are busted. You know, for her and tens of thousands of other passengers, a shiny new train somewhere far away will not be much consolation. And so if you have 1 billion dollars in your budget, let's say, and maglev would cost 1 billion, conventional rail 500 million, and hyperloop 250 million, in a private company's opinion, which one would you build? So, just on the face of it, you could say, oh yeah, of course we're gonna build the Hyperloop, we're gonna save a bunch of money and have this new high-tech solution, but then some of your voters or political opponents might do some thinking for longer than five seconds. And so they might ask, hey, how come just maglev is four times as expensive as maglev in a vacuum tube? Uh, you know, shouldn't it be the other way around? Does this company have any uh, price references from projects that actually happened? No? Uh, okay. So is it a possibility that a company proposes a price at the beginning of a project and that that price starts climbing and climbing and climbing, reaching three to five times the original estimate at the end? Especially if the system only exists on paper so far and cannot produce any real-life estimates. So you do see why a decision maker would have a really hard time selling this to voters. And actually this is the reason why you only see Hyperloop projects in developing and or autocratic countries with young or non-existent democracies, because there the people have little to no control over how public money is spent. So if you ever wondered why it's always, you know, dictatorships that seem to be jumping on these shiny new bullshit projects, well, that's why. And so the engineering problems, together with the financial problems and political problems, make the Hyperloop a complete non-starter. And so I don't think we should be taking the Hyperloop any more seriously than the French Aerotrain. You know, one or two Hyperloops might get built somewhere actually, uh, most likely in autocratic regimes. But then it's going to be like the Shanghai Maglev, you know, big fanfare, huge expectations, but then people slowly realize that eh, it's not that good actually. You know, Shanghai would have been better off with like an airport S-Bahn or something, which could stop on the way and actually serve the local community, instead of, you know, just whizzing past neighborhoods. And if they really wanted to, I mean, for that kind of price, they could have just built four tracks and have the middle tracks act as the express service and the outer tracks as the stopping everywhere kind of service. But no, the Chinese government, an autocratic regime by the way, decided that the people of Shanghai need a maglev, and so it was built. And it's pretty underwhelming, it makes a ton of losses, and it doesn't serve the community. You know, unless you happen to be a commuter between the city center and the airport. And so I think this is the best case scenario for the Hyperloop. 
it's going to be this like ultra exclusive, ultra expensive, rich people transport between like a convention center and an airport or something, you know, to shiny, highly sanitized locations where mortals don't usually go. And so I think it is time we stop taking the Hyperloop seriously because it is nothing new. For the past century, we've been trying to come up with this, this one idea. The one idea that will whisk us into the future on the wings of fucking science magic, which will just wash away all our current bad, outdated, old, no good technology in a tidal wave of innovation and genius. Such was the promise of the Aerotrain, the Maglev, and now the Hyperloop. But all of them failed to bring about the revolution. Because turns out, in terms of financing, politics and engineering, conventional rail is the best option. It is simple and just works. Thank you for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing. And I'll see you when I'll see you.